Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Kelly McDevitt. We'll get our webinar started here in just a few minutes. I'll let everybody get logged in and join. All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. I am Kelly McDevitt, president of IBI. Welcome to our webinar today on shining a spotlight on virtual care use in the workplace. Um, we embarked on this research uh, over a year ago now when it was very clear that the pandemic was causing quite a rise in the use of both tele and virtual care. Um, as you all know, um, our, our utilization of virtual care was not what we all expected and wanted pre-pandemic, but obviously um, when the pandemic hit and folks weren't able to get out to their providers, um, we sought care through virtual means or through telehealth means. And we really wanted to study you know, what the effect of that was both on uh, from a productivity perspective, um, but also really how that worked out from an outcomes perspective. Um, we got our research questions together from our research committee made up of our membership and asked what questions they wanted answered. And really, I think what we tried to focus on was what were the results of people using virtual care? And we partnered something different this time in a research project for us. We partnered with our friends at United Healthcare uh, to not only support the research that we did, but to see how it really played out, um, our research answers played out in the claims data. And so you'll have a little bit of a, a different view today here than our normal um, just research uh, projects. So I want you all to keep in mind that as we thought through the research and the claims data, we really wanted to center on how to help employers make decisions going forward. And so, you know, most employers mid-market to national account space have had national um, virtual care solutions in place for quite some uh, many years now. Um, and to help figure out how we morph that into our future, into our new normal, and what those solutions look like, uh, what the products and programs that they offer look like going forward, and how as employees, uh, they can best utilize those services to either fill gaps in network or to keep people at work, productive at work. Um, those are some of the questions that we were thinking in our minds as we were doing the research and looking at the claims data. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Nicole Nixick, who is our lead researcher on this project. And she's gonna kick off uh, the day with what the research was about uh, what we discovered in the research, and then turn it over to May Doris from United Healthcare, who can kind of fill in the blanks with the claims data. So I'll turn it over to Nikki. Great, thanks, Kelly. Um, as Kelly mentioned, I'm the lead researcher here at IBI, and I led the um, research portion of this project. So just a quick agenda of what we're going to go through. I'm going to give you a very, very brief background over the research questions that kind of led um, this analysis. I'll be giving the results for the national data for 2020 and 2021. Um, May will take over and give you guys results from um, United Healthcare claims. And then Kelly will come back in at the end and 
um, lead a discussion on employer insights. And of course, we'll have time at the end um, for Q&A and you can always pop them into the chat box as well. So as Kelly um, was kind of mentioning before about how our members kind of vote for our projects for the year and what's important to them, um, this was the uh, virtual care was the second highest concern right behind mental health, which we did last year. And so, you know, this was a concern because obviously during the pandemic, during lockdown, we we're seeing this dramatic increase of people using virtual care. Um, and so kind of wanted to see how this increase remained throughout the year and how and how people were kind of receiving that was was virtual care kind of closing this gap of in-person visits um, or people that needed care still receiving it and just kind of differences and disparities in receiving and um, providing treatment as well. So um, we wanted to kind of look at expand um, from national data and get kind of a claims background to really kind of see how use is, is spanning the pandemic and what that kind of looks like for employees. Um, so just, again, kind of using national data to see who is using it, what these people kind of look like, are there different differences in demographics and health conditions, and then kind of following that up with the claims data to look at what people are, you know, what subscribers are using, what providers they're using, and again, are there differences in their care and in their demographics as well as their subscriber profiles. So just in this first data set that I used from 2020, went from July to December, we used the National Health Interview Survey, something that we've used in several research projects in previous years. So this one's collected by the CDC online. And we had about just over 8,500 employed adults. And when we look at that, about 28% of those had used um, virtual appointment in the past 12 months. Um, but we were able to kind of focus in um, with this particular data set for those that were already seeking care. So we wanted to know about those who saw a doctor within the past year and within that like subset, um, what their virtual care looked like. So four and five em um, employees did visit a doctor in the last year from when they took the survey in 2020. And from that, about one in three employees, 34.2% had used virtual care and we weren't seeing a change in that. That was consistent from July to December, so just over a third. And then when we're looking at, you know, their self-reported self -reported urgent care and ER visits, we're seeing that that increases um, across the number of times that they're actually using it. So, we're seeing under average for for not for virtual care use for not visiting um, urgent care or the ER, but then we're seeing this really high increase in virtual care use when people are using urgent care three times or more, when they're using ER one or even two or more times, and so it can kind of go on the assumption here that people are you know potentially using urgent care or using virtual care first and then being told that they need to actually see somebody in person. And so what does it look like with virtual care when we're actually missing work? Um, so missing work due to illness, injury, or disability, um, you know, the vast majority, nearly 60% of employees were saying that they weren't missing any work within, within the last year and they were using virtual care the least. Of course, that's, you know, the healthiest group there. Um, but then we're seeing consistent increase in virtual care use as you're missing more days of work as well. So looking at employees who have different health issues, um, who have self-reported impairment, so that's, you know, difficulties with walking, seeing, hearing, we're also seeing they're using this telehealth, or using telehealth and virtual care more as well. So um, not only that, when they're missing work, they're also using virtual care more as well. But the kind of difference between these employees and just the general working population is that if you have a health issue or a self-reported impairment, you're also using virtual care more when you are missing days of work and then more when you're missing a lot of work, 11 or more days. So into the three week territory due to illness. And you know that could be kind of said that people are potentially using virtual care so that they can continue to work. Um, and then also when that's just, you know, kind of on the extreme end of when they're sick for longer periods of time as well. 
it's kind of breaking down by different um, health conditions. So unfortunately, the survey doesn't break down exactly why you're using virtual care, what you're going for, but we can at least look at people who have different kinds of diagnoses if they're using virtual care at all. And um, not surprisingly, we're seeing it very high for depression and anxiety, um, as well as for if you had COVID, um, but we're also seeing it you know, fairly high for those that have diabetes as well. So breaking down conditions by missing work. Again, if you have diabetes or if you have depression, anxiety was similar, you know, you're using this, you're using virtual care more than if you were not diagnosed with these or these conditions at all. And with diabetes, we're seeing um, that people are using virtual care more when they're not missing work. Again, kind of on that assumption that they're using this kind of virtual care to continue to work and you know the convenience of that. Um, but we're kind of seeing the opposite with depression and anxiety is very similar here. Um, and we, we would expect this, that even with missing work, you're using that virtual care. As we know, a lot of um, providers went to the um, use mental health services on an online platform as well. So just able to look at kind of different industries of who's using virtual care the most, and we're seeing public administration, education, followed closely by healthcare. Um, at the top of that list and at the bottom, um, you know, we're seeing retail, wholesale, manufacturing. And then going into different kinds of occupations, education, business, financial, again, healthcare at the top here. And then again, at the bottom, we're seeing sales, production, food prep, and food serving, different occupations are using healthcare or virtual care the least, excuse me. Um, and kind of looking at different access by location, um, I just posted a blog about the importance of access and different things you can do to potentially increase access within employee population. Um, but overall, the table, not surprising, we're seeing use highest in urban big city areas and that decreases as we go up, expand into rural populations. Um, you know, the South has the most population in the country, but they're using virtual care the least. And then in all the different regions here, we're seeing, besides the Northeast, we're seeing that decrease um, from a statistical standpoint, we're seeing that decrease from cities, again, urban moving out, except in the Northeast. My prediction on that is just things are, you know, more denser, it's a smaller land area. So though we're seeing the decrease, it's not in a significant way. And then brushing on different demographics here, where I'm kind of focusing and, and targeting on people that use it the least. And we're looking at males that are younger, less educated, um, identify as black, have low income, um, also those that were never married, no health insurance, things like that. Um, we did not see differences in, in how many kids you had at home, um, and that we can say is probably likely due to these are employees that are already seeking care, so it's probably evenly split through no matter how many kids you have, because you're already in that kind of sense. So these kind of come back when we look at 2021 data next. So we use the 2021 Household Pulse Survey. It's also what we use for our mental health data. And it is collected by the US Census Bureau. And we looked at April through October of 2021, separate weeks on that, and had over 350,000 um, employed adults in the past seven days. So here we're, we're looking at the in total adult pop, or employed population here. So we're looking at just those who use virtual care at all in the past four weeks from when they were surveyed, regardless if they were healthcare seekers or not. So we're seeing um, here, one in five employed adults were using virtual care during this time, but we're seeing a significant decrease um, after the July 4th holidays, actually. Um, and they also asked a question about what you use more and um, we're seeing that virtual you know, video use was more popular than using the phone. They also asked about um, their children's use, not surprising. It, mirrors what the adults did themselves. And again, we're seeing that, that decrease that we didn't have in 2020, but now we're seeing it in the summer of 2021 here um, after that 4th of July holiday. But 
although this decrease is happening, um, you know, slight decrease in, in virtual care that we're seeing here, we're seeing a big increase in children not getting preventive checkups during the same time as well. So when we're looking at employees that are working outside of the home and looking at their virtual um, care here, not surprising, we're seeing high virtual care use amongst those in you know, healthcare services, nursing home and hospital workers and things like that. And then again, at the end, at the bottom of this, we're seeing like the manufacturing, we're seeing food and beverage, um, other people that don't um, identify in these other groups as well. And just to note here that most employees did work in the private sector, like over 60%, but they use virtual care less than people that worked in public sector or worked at home, of course. So when we're looking at um, telehealth use when it comes to different health status, disability, those that seek out health care more, these are all people that are using telehealth more. So we didn't get the nice different ranges of different health conditions like we had in the other survey, but those at least that had um, diagnosed with COVID, um, received the COVID-19 vaccine, those that were delaying their care, eventually used um, telehealth virtual care. Um, we're also seeing those that were on Medicare for disability were using telehealth more, that self-reported impairment. And then also if you had seen a, um, a provider or went to the dentist in person, we're also seeing that you're using virtual care. Again, that's probably the people that are higher activators that are going to be using healthcare in, in different modes as, as well. So again, location, we had some state data, so we're able to make this nice map here. And uh, again, showing you know Midwest and South use the least, and then we're seeing these darker states with higher use on the East Coast as well as the West Coast. And again, just demographic profile aligns a lot with 2020. We're seeing those males that are younger with lower education, that weren't married, um, are using virtual care less. And then also here though, um, we're seeing difference for how many kids you have. Um, and these again are the full adult population. Not all of these people are natural health seekers or have seen you know, a doctor for any reason within last year. So with zero kids and two kids, you're using it less. And I can't speak from experience, um, told you you're using it more when you have one kid with the freak out and then you know, you're on the, when you have two kids, it's, it's not as much. So I'm seeing a little bit different um, profile here for that part. But again, you know, the males, the younger, um, less educated are using uh, the virtual care a little bit less. So that wraps up my portion. I'm going to hand control over to May to run through her slides on um, the claims data. Before we do that, Nikki, I just want to jump in and, and kind of do another level set here about the research. So when we went into this research project, as I said, we tried to think about what employers, when they would have to evaluate their current tele or virtual health programs, you know, what would they need to know? What would they want to look at? What data would they need to be successful? And thinking about one of the things that Nicole touched on, we're still in this state of delayed or avoided care. So um, until it comes back fully, you know, we have people who are um, not being diagnosed and we have people who are not being treated that are already ill. So think about 18 months from now when employers are dealing with possibly a particularly high trend that we haven't seen in many years, and they have to look back upon their programs and choose what's working, what's not, what we all have to go through, right, to uh, figure out ROI or BOI for the programs you already have in place. We went back to our employers and asked them, why did you put in telehealth or virtual care in the first place? What challenges were you trying to solve for? And overwhelmingly, the answers were the same. Number one, it was the shiny new object, right? It was a, a, an exciting thing uh, years ago uh, to be able to have virtual care available for patients. We hope that it would keep people at work more often, increase productivity and presenteeism, or, or decrease absenteeism at least. Um, some were looking to fill gaps in networks. So 
What was an interesting fact about what Nick, Nikki just presented was um, we are seeing that that part is not working, right? So where rural network gaps may occur or people have to travel a fair distance to be able to get to care in person, we are not finding those people using um, virtual care. The other thing that's interesting is within the age groups that Nikki was talking about, I think people make an assumption that, you know, younger folks are going to use virtual care because they like to use their phones and um, for convenience. And that is another issue that most employers were trying to solve for, employee convenience. And um, years ago, you know, we when we first rolled out telehealth solutions, we made the co-pays or the co-insurance a little lower than in-person care. So these are the things that we wanted to look at to help our employers make decisions going forward um, as they weigh the solutions they have in place today. So now May is going to talk to us about how the claims data supports the research that Nikki did and what we saw in the claims data play out from 2020 through 2021. All yours, May. All right. Well, guys, thanks for having me. Um, I took a look at our national account book of business and wanted to see, you know, these trends in virtual care. And let's see if the controls work. We did test this. Just give me one second, guys. There we go. So we're talking about virtual visits in medical. We've got two kinds. You know, we've got these virtual first providers, and then we've got, you know, I think virtual first is going to be your doctors on demand, Amwell, Teladoc. But then we have the traditional doctors. So the doctors that have brick and mortar locations that you can see there. But then when COVID hit, now you can also see them virtually. So they're two very distinct kind of virtual visits. And we'll get into both of them because they have, you know, very different patterns of utilization. Um, and if you can see here with COVID, um, you know, people are back in the office right now. You know, they're going back. Most of the meetings, our visits are in person. I'd say about, well, getting up there about 90%. Um, and of the virtual visits, the majority, 90% uh, of those virtual visits are with a traditional prior, provider. So while those virtual first providers did see tremendous growth with COVID, um, it was far outpaced uh, by the growth in the virtual visits by those traditional providers. So, and you can see here, it is kind of um, leveled off the virtual visits. So when we're looking at our national account and I just looked at it updated, you know, we're seeing about 89% of visits are in person. And then this mix with our virtual provider mix has been pretty stable on medical visits, okay? And so we're seeing that it's kind of stabilized. Um, there is some variation, but overall post COVID, um, the pandemic start, it's, it's kind of tapered off. If we throw in though, behavioral health, that's a very different uh, scene there. Uh, behavioral health, we're seeing almost over two thirds of visits for behavioral health are now virtual and it's stayed virtual. So that has stabilized at a much higher level than medical. And that makes sense, um, you know, given the reasons and um, the types of visit. So we're seeing that remain high, you know, those virtual visits for behavioral health, but, you know, for the most part, we're looking at, you know, routine care and sickness for these virtual medical visits. All right, so again, we're gonna look at our virtual providers. So these are the ones you call up, you know, you generally just request any doctor, the first that comes available. We're looking at it from September of 20, um, all the way through August of 21, right? A lot of data here. Um, what I want to point out to you is that we're, you know, we're really focused on those first two columns. So we had members that used a virtual provider and then members that had claims, but no virtual provider visit. So let's compare those two. And demographically, they're pretty similar. Uh, the retrospective risk score is going to be their disease burden, pretty similar. Their activation, which is our measure of decision-making, 
the members that use virtual providers tend to have a higher score there. And they're just really good at using all their resources. And well, that'll kind of be one of the themes of these members is that they're high utilizers. They know their benefits, they know what they have available, they know how to use them, okay? Taking a look at the paid or allowed amounts, let's look at the non-catastrophic. If you've got a catastrophic member, virtual care, a virtual provider, probably not a good idea. So let's look at these non-catastrophic. You can see um, spend-wise, the virtual provider utilizers are actually a little bit lower, okay? Um, you know, if we go down, the one that really jumps out though is that ER utilization. Look at that, 259 visits per thousand for members that used a virtual provider versus 179 for those that didn't. You can also see that the allowed amount per visit, which is directionally correlates with how serious was this ER visit, is a little bit lower. Those urgent care visits, really high. You know, we're seeing those much higher, over 50% higher for those members that utilize a virtual provider. These are your high utilizers. These are members, if they're on the fence, they're gonna go to the doctor. Um, and we'll get into more about, you know, who they are and uh, what else we see in their data. So why are they going? Um, that's a big one. You can see that injury and poisoning, you know, they're more likely to go, but it's not a huge gap. But then you get into all the other potential areas for why they're going, and you can see that they're far more likely to go. So, you know, those respiratory conditions, you know, we've got some folks on the end that will have a sinus infection for several months and never go. And then you have somebody who is watching the clock and they're like, no, it's been 10 days, I can go see the doctor now. And so these members that utilize the virtual visits tend to be the ones that are, you know, more likely to go. You know, on those, on those visits, they're gonna be there. And the same for urgent care. You know, they're gonna be more likely to go in. They're gonna see those. Um, when we're looking at who these members are, um, looking at the percentage of people in different age groups that are using it, um, those females age 26 to 39, or even up to 49 were the big utilizers, you know, with almost seven, you know 7%, which is the highest. Men are much less likely to use it. Um, and you can see that kind of distribution at the upper end and lower end uh, of people wanting to use it. Overall, about almost 3% of members though had a virtual visit. Trying to watch my time here. Um, we did a, a geographic analysis. This is based on the members' um, state of residence. So that Vegas, uh, Nevada you see out there, it's not weekends gone wrong. That's members that live in Nevada. Um, so they had the highest utilization and then members in Rhode Island had the lowest. What we're seeing though is the rural members far less likely to have a visit with a virtual provider. And that's either the virtual first providers or the traditional providers compared to the urban members. So, you know, one of the things we talk about there is the access. And we actually were able to look at the FCC data for broadband access, and it lines up almost exactly. You know, members with access to high-speed internet were much more likely to access a virtual provider. And that makes sense. Um, so those two are very strongly correlated. So you kind of can't talk with one issue without talking about the others. Um, we did looks by income. You know, we found that, you know, there are on our end, the lower household incomes uh, tend to have a little bit higher utilization. Um, and they also have a higher ER utilization, but that's kind of, if you see it, it's kind of stable for both, um, that those uh, ER utilization tends to decrease with an increase in income. And that was pretty, um, stayed the same with both the utilizers of virtual visits and non. Yeah. We also did a look by ethnicity, and this is inferred data um, that we get. And you can see that the Hispanic utilization for virtual providers was really solid. It was uh, over 3%. Um, and if you go over to the other chart with our ER visits, so that's, you know, how many ER visits, who are, are you know, are they going? Um, you can see that their ER utilization is also on the high side for both uh, 
utilizers of virtual visits and members that did not utilize those virtual visits. Same for African Americans, those are both high utilizers. So it, what we're trying to figure out is, is those virtual providers, is that impacting their ER utilization? And what we're finding is that same pattern of members that use a virtual provider, much more likely to go to the ER. That's staying true throughout all these different views that we've uh, been looking at. Um, and then let's look at like, why are people going? So on the left, we've got the broad categories and you can see respiratory. That's gonna be the big one, that makes sense. Uh, genital urinary, it's gonna be your UT, uh, UTIs. We're gonna see you know, rashes, things like that. Those are making up the bulk of those and everything else is you know, kind of a catch all. But if we look at those top 10 diagnosis, so if we narrow it down, we're looking at the actual diagnosis, you can see that you know, numbers one and five are gonna be UTI related. And then we've got two, three, six, seven, and eight are respiratory, cough, cold, that kind of uh, you know, reasons for going to a virtual provider which makes sense. These are the kind of things you would see a virtual provider for. It's not ongoing care. You need to see somebody. So now COVID was actually pretty low down on the list. Um, and part of that is the testing. So um, you can't get tested virtually. So I think a lot of those virtual visits um, for COVID just didn't make sense. People were much more likely to utilize an urgent care or uh, in-person provider just so that they could get that testing done. So they didn't want to do two visits they just went ahead and did that one visit. All right, so that's our virtual visit. We're gonna spend just a brief amount of time talking about the virtual visits with the traditional providers. So for here, we looked at our subscribers that utilized the traditional virtual visit, and then also uh, how they stacked up to those that used the virtual first providers, those national providers. Um, so, you know, 25% of members used a virtual provider. You know, 20% 20, 20 with that traditional provider. And then, you know, we talked about that 3% uh, with the virtual provider for subscribers. Demographically, the members that use the traditional provider tend to be a little older. And then if you go in the, looking at that subscriber risk score, that's that disease burden. You can see that the members that utilize the traditional providers virtual visits have a much higher disease burden. And because that is just why they were using it. Um, it wasn't a one-off sinus infection that they're seeing their provider virtually for. It was more likely to be ongoing disease management. So we are seeing that uh, play out in their, uh, their disease burden and on their utilization. You can see their activation, they do pretty well. Um, they make good decisions, um, but those people that do those virtual providers, they're the ones that are all over it and have the best decision-making scores. Um, ER visits, okay? Now you can see that the people that are using those traditional providers uh, to see them virtually, they had 263 ER visits per thousand. We're looking at subscribers only. That's much higher. But again, they had that higher disease burden. So if you look at the green line, that's the allowed amount per visit. And that's kind of directionally shows you how serious that visit was. So you can see that for the members that use the traditional provider virtually, they have the highest allowed amount per visit. So this tends to be for more serious things. Whereas members that use the virtual provider, they had the lowest uh, allowed amount per visit, which suggests that it was for less serious, okay? So just a little bit of difference. They did have that high, but you know, are they utilizing it appropriately? It looks like so, okay. Um, we wanna take a little deeper dive into just a condition because this is what a lot of those virtual visits with the uh, traditional provider were for, was for managing like something like diabetes. And you know, again, if you look, if we're gonna look at that uh, retrospective risk score, so that's that disease burden. The members who are seeing a traditional provider virtually have a much higher disease burden. These people are sicker, they need more care, and virtual care with the traditional provider has just been a way for them to access that care. So they do have higher cost, but again, it's that higher risk profile. Um, what was interesting to see is that even with their higher risk, 
um, their ER visits per thousand were below the members that use the virtual providers, suggesting that the traditional providers are doing a good job managing that condition. Yeah. Um, you know, again, they had high utilization for urgent care, but still lower than those traditional providers or virtual providers, excuse me. And just looking here at their decision-making, you know, we've got um, the diabetics with no virtual carers, that's the dark blue. And then the ones that access the traditional provider, those are the two in the middle, the lighter blue, and then the virtual providers in the yellow. And you can see there's not huge discrepancies um, in this, but on a lot of these metrics, the prevention, the engagement, um, resource use, well-being, the members that utilize the traditional providers have better decision-making and scores in there. Um, you know, site of care, that a lot of things play into that. I wouldn't, you know, read too much into that. Um, and if we look at like diabetic specific measures, you know, what are we measuring here? Um, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag there, um, but overall they tend to do a good job of getting those screenings, getting that provider visit, uh, taking their medication, getting those exams. Um, not as big of a difference there, but still good scores overall. Right, and I see my cat has made an appearance. Uh, but I think I'll now pass it back to Kelly and Nicole for questions. Thanks, May. Um, so we do have some questions coming in, um, but before we get there, I just wanted to kind of go through with you all uh, if May, could you advance the slides to my slide real quick while you still have yep. control, please? Um, we talked about- I apologize. That, no, no, that's fine, right there is great. We talked about why we did this project and you know what we learned. And I think that some of the things that, that Nikki and May have gone through were you know, no brainers. It was a pandemic. So in the early days in, 2020 at least, um, if you called a virtual care provider and you had symptoms of COVID, chances are they were sending you to an urgent care or uh, an ER, right? So the numbers that may presented in that data, keep in mind the time period that we're looking at. Um, so when people sought care, whether it was from their traditional provider or from a, a virtual care vendor, uh, provider, the result oftentimes, if they were talking about COVID symptoms, were probably the same. They went uh, were sent either to their own doctor, to an urgent care, or to the ER. I think what, uh, and we did get a question on this, what's going to be important going forward is measuring now that we're in sort of a post-pandemic world, uh, let's say working our way back to normal, um, now we measure those results. Does the cost of uh, medical care on the whole go down when virtual care utilization goes up? And so are we actually you know, avoiding more costly care by using virtual care in its place? Um, and you know, we looked at things like that uh, during the research and it's, we could probably correlate some answers there, but knowing that care was already so suppressed. Um, people weren't getting care for chronic conditions, for preventive care, et cetera, and even for much needed care like cancer care or, or surgeries. Uh, it's hard to say for those who used virtual care, did their traditional medical costs go down because all care was down? And so um, those are interesting questions, but I think ones that we will have to measure going forward. So real quick, just to, to wrap up, um, when we did this research, we always at IBI go out and ask our employers for insights on these, on these topics. Um, some of these things we've already touched on, you know, larger employers, mid-market to national account size employers, integrated national health vendors as part of their benefit plans and strategy way, way before the pandemic came, um, reasons convenience, cost savings to the employee, especially if the copay or the coinsurance was lower, and then the hope of less missed work time. Um, access was also an issue for some employers where they uh, think that they don't have access, particularly in rural areas or low-income areas, people might utilize virtual care. Unfortunately, our, our research did not find that necessarily to be true. 
Um, but that, as Ming indicated, could be also be affected by outside, outside influences, such as do they have broadband or do they have a smartphone? Do they have the technology needed in order to actually use the, the uh, product and program that's available to them? Um, <clears throat> looking at how your members are utilizing virtual care is really important. And you all um, from this particular project hopefully saw some data that you would need to study to know the answers to these questions. Um, as Nikki said at the beginning of the meeting, we will have this deck available to you after the webinar. So you will be able to see some of the data points that you might wanna measure in your own population to help you figure out, are my employees using traditional providers uh, who have stood up a virtual care option and will they continue to do so? Are they using, using the national vendors? What does your correlating uh, urgent and ER usage look like? And then really, of course, always focus on outcomes. What was the outcome of those visits? And are they now um, using virtual care on an ongoing basis for things like um, traditional disease management care? <clears throat> Um, communications were extremely important to all of our employers that we spoke to. Um, some employers got very creative doing magnets, postcards, using QR scanning codes to send to employees to let them know um, that their uh, virtual care was available to them. I think we, in this research, we really separated mental health over here because that virtual care was solving a completely different problem. And then, you know, virtual medical care over here because they, they study very differently. And um, so when you look at how to communicate these programs, you may want to look at communicating the virtual care for mental health and the products and programs you have available there very differently than you look at the virtual care for your medical um, diagnoses. All employers said the same thing. These communications have to be focused, concise, intentional, and constant. So, I mean, I don't have to tell you all communicating um, often and very concisely is, is what you need to do with your employees to let them know that they have these things available to them. Um, ex expanding virtual care into new uh, well-being programs is something that a lot of employers are looking at now. And that's why we advise to really look at the data about the programs you have in place already before you branch off into <clears throat> some of the new virtual care options for physical, emotional, financial, social, workplace, um, you, would, you would be, I think it's ill-advised to branch off into more virtual care until you actually know how your, um, how your population is behaving today with the solutions that they have in place. There is no doubt there's any number of these solutions out there in the market. Um, obviously, you all know how to go through an RFI or an RFP process in which you select the best vendor looking at holistic solutions um, that are helping with attraction and retention of new employees and existing employees is very important to employers right now. So they're looking at these solutions as a, as a way to sort of put their arms around their employees and help them to be healthier and happier at work. So I do see we have a bunch of questions and so I'm gonna save the last 15 minutes. Uh, for May and Nikki's questions. So the first one I, I kind of already touched on, and that was, did do medical costs go down as a result of virtual visits? Um, I'm gonna let May answer this, but I will say that I think it would be very hard for us to correlate that at least during 2020 and 2021, because medical costs were down um, overall. But May, do you have a, um, a thought on yeah. that one? Um it's just very hard to say, um, you know, there's, and of course you've got the two different types of virtual visits. Um, you know, I see another question there, does virtual visits cause visits that wouldn't have been visits? And we think understandably, yes. If it's Saturday and you're not feeling well, but you don't have to get off the couch. Okay. So you see where this is going. Um, from a cost standpoint though, you have to look at the cost of a virtual visit, which is around 50 bucks. And then we look at the cost of an ER visit, which is 2,500. So you've got 50 virtual visits for one ER visit, or you know, five or six urgent care visits. And again, we talked about these people are high utilizers. So we don't have any data to, you know, 
prove this, but my gut is that these people would seek care elsewhere, probably. So this is another good venue uh, avenue for them to access care. Does it save money? Eh. It's unclear. Yeah, I, think, I don't think it's dramatic either way. Yeah, I, and I think I agree. This is this is one of those things going forward and, and really going back to before 2020, you can look at your um, virtual care utilization and medical costs <clears throat> correlated for those individuals who used it before the pandemic. During the pandemic, it's much harder because there were so many other outside um, pressures from the pandemic itself that affected costs and obviously utilization during that time. So to say somebody had a virtual care visit and they wouldn't have had a medical visit or that or the or the opposite that they had a virtual care visit which caused more visits right it's really hard to measure that in the pandemic world um, when we you know we're in a situation where people could not be seen in person um, and so much care was directed to urgent and ER care whether you saw your own provider or a virtual care vendor a national vendor um, I will say that some employers as they're thinking about their go forward. Uh, strategy are talking about whether or not their strategy includes driving care back into what what is you know oftentimes referred to as a medical home model or PCP selection etc. So if a person has a relationship with a doctor, do you prefer that they see them whether it's virtual or in person, um, and then really sub bucketing those folks into those who are healthy and need preventive care versus those who have a medical diagnosis or comorbidities or complex care, you know, where would you like to drive that utilization, whether it be virtual or in person, is should be part of an employer strategy. And really, uh, you know, as I talk to my employer friends, I feel like we're getting back into years ago segmentation. This is all about knowing your population. Um, not only their preferences, which we're all very concerned about right now, but how they utilize care and how they prefer to utilize care. And then also which care would uh, affect the best outcomes for those different populations. Um, the next question is, and again, probably May, this is going to be for you. Did you look at any data, and I don't think we did, um, on utilization when virtual care was free or discounted from a full copay. I don't know if we had that plan we design to look at. Yeah, we didn't look at that. And again, that's going to be that COVID noise because a lot of the people moved it for free because of COVID. So right. um, it'd be hard to track what was driving that utilization, if it was cost or not. I mean, generally cost yeah. does help, but um, sure. we don't have any clear data just given the COVID noise. Let me, let me ask this. Could you at least look at... Um, utilization between those that had zero copay versus something other than zero copay? Um, we could. Okay. Yeah. It might be interesting um, to see if, you know, cost was a big driver for folks. Um, if, they, if they did choose to use virtual care, those who have a $50 copay for virtual care versus those who had a zero copay for virtual care, you know, if that really affected utilization in any way. Okay. I think we do see slightly higher utilization on the high deductible health plans. So, you know, members do have a little bit higher utilization, but again, those tend to be younger, more tech savvy uh, members that are just, you know, more knowledgeable about their plans. That's why they're on a high deductible health plan. So we can though take a look at that. Yeah. Um, and then the next question, um, did virtual care providers integrate or share their data on visits with the employer's health plan or employer's worksite clinics if there was one available? Um, I think that really, and, and May, you can uh, weigh in here as well, but that really depends on mm -hmm. the virtual care provider, one, and the employer, right? So the employer um, typically would be requesting who that data is shared with. Typically, at least the large mm -hmm. national vendors uh, can very easily plug and play their data into either a data warehouse, uh, a health plan to mm -hmm. be used for things like disease management programs and wellness programs. Um, but that's really typically, at least mm -hmm. in self-insured environment, up to the employer and the abilities of the virtual yeah. care provider. May, do you have anything to add? I'd say in, in large part, the virtual care 
um, you know, those virtual first providers, those claims do run through us. And so we can see everything we can normally see um, with the on-site clinic. So that's a very per employer basis about what is able to get shared. Um, so sometimes that picture can be incomplete. Yeah, and, and I will say the same about at least the early adopters in the non-national vendor world. So for our traditional yeah. providers, mom, you know, mom and pop providers that are not necessarily hospital owned or large practices who had to stand up a virtual care solution very quickly um, yeah. and some, some kind of clunky, the exchange of data through a traditional provider at first during the pandemic may have actually been less than with the national providers because they had been doing those things for years in the virtual world. Uh, they probably caught up very quickly because at least the data is in the chart, but the, the data exchange of something other than the encounter, meaning I'm billing a virtual mm -hmm. care visit, um, may have been a little clunky at the very beginning. I think most of that has worked out by now. Do you agree, May? Yeah. It, it took some doing, a lot of behind the scenes, but yeah, I think it's pretty, pretty worked out by now. Okay, fantastic. A lot of IT guys had a lot of late nights. Yes, <laughs> I'm sure, and you know, and and not for nothing, you know, traditional mm -hmm. doctors' offices weren't necessarily set up to to take on this type of a role. They don't have IT departments typically. So, um, okay. Um, yep. Next question. Since virtual care utilization appears lower in the rural areas, do you have any data comparing the availability or number of in-person providers in urban versus rural settings or physician to patient ratio in urban versus rural settings? Curious about whether rural utilization is lower due to lack of internet access or because in-person provider visits are more readily available in a smaller population. Okay, that's a lot to unpack. So May talked about and presented, it's in the deck, um, the lack of internet access. So that's very clear. In rural areas, utilization is lower and we believe there's a direct correlation between them having access to um, high-speed yeah. internet um, and then curious about whether rural utilization is lower due to lack of internet, yes, um, or because in-person provider visits are more readily available in a more small, in a smaller population. So, so two things. Your first question is, can mm -hmm. you see what the availability is of a provider in a either urban, rural, or suburban? The answer is yes. Any, any healthcare um, um, provider, you know, any of the mm -hmm. large carriers can do a network access report and tell you what in-person providers are available. I think many are now also looking at not only in-person availability for those traditional providers, but virtual availability for those traditional providers. Mm -hmm. So um, you can look at that and an employer can have those reports run very readily by their medical carrier. Um, that's a function of the network access um, folks within that, within that business. Um, I, I don't think the last part of the question, um, is it because of in-person provider visits are more readily available? Typically that is not the case in rural areas. Yeah. So it, it's, we, we would see if you overlaid network access in rural areas um, with providers and virtual national virtual care providers, you, I mean, you would see that, you know, virtual care is much more readily available in rural areas. Readily available, but not necessarily looking at base data accessible because of the internet yeah. issue. Yeah. Anything to add, May? No, I think that tracks yep. from okay. what we're seeing. All righty, next question. Um, did virtual care third-party providers prescribe more than traditional providers using virtual care? This is a really good question and one that the pre-pandemic, um, we typically do track as part of our um, ongoing sort of mm -hmm. outcomes data are third, either virtual care at a traditional provider or through a vendor, um, what are the prescribing patterns, right, of that particular care? I think 
during the pandemic, again, it was sort of all everything out the window yeah. at that point, because not only were folks not, there was no care to provide, to prescribe for, right? You had to be tested before you could get any type of care. And in 2020, there wasn't much available to you, certainly not by prescription. And second, um, this is one of those issues that sort of post pandemic world, you should always be tracking with your virtual care visits as part of your data set. Are virtual visits causing more or less prescriptions to be written than a traditional provider? May, I, I know you had looked at accessing prescription drug data during your research. So we looked at this um, prior to COVID on the fully insured block because we have pharmacy data. You know, we, we need to be able to tie those together. So do virtual providers prescribe more uh, antibiotics than the traditional? Slightly, yeah. Um, urgent cares also do, but then again, the more serious cases go to urgent care. Um, so I think there was, you know, in the early days of virtual care, it was just like, you get antibiotics, you get antibiotics. And I think they've really reined that in um, and are being much more uh, cautious about that. So they are elevated. I don't think it's, you know, uh, terrible though, uh, when you think about it. We looked at, you know, major things like, um, you know, UTIs, respiratory infections, those are really common things in order to compare those. And, you know, they were generally at or below where urgent care was no, pre-pandemic, so. Right. Okay, I know we only have a couple of minutes left, so I will let you all have time for one more question in the Q&A before we wrap. Okay, well, I'm giving it a minute. I'm just going to sort of wrap up our thoughts here. <clears throat> I think that our purpose for doing this uh, particular research and why our members asked for this research um, was to help employers figure out what now, right? So the pandemic obviously brought telehealth and virtual care to the forefront. Um, now we need to study how that played out in your population and as you move forward, how you may or may, may not want to adjust your strategy and your products and programs accordingly for the future. So as we start thinking about, um, I think I've playfully named it the great reckoning instead of the great resignation, the great reckoning of this hush crush period that we are in. So we're still in this delayed care, avoided care um, mess that we've been in for two years now when that starts to play out in your claims data in the form of you know, much sicker people, undiagnosed population, high cost claimants, and as employers and their supplier partners, we have to look back on all the products and programs that we've been using these past two years and decide which ones we keep and which ones we don't. What data and insights will you need as an employer to make those decisions, to make good decisions going forward? So we hope that this information, both the research that Dr. Nixick did and that May provided us in the claims data can help you to see the type of information you will need to help you make those sound decisions going forward. As always, we thank you for joining us and we hope this was very informative. The um, presentation and the recording will be available to you on our website for our members um, and it will be sent out after the meeting. If you have any questions at all, don't hesitate, hesitate to contact us through email. You can write to me or you can write to um, Dr. Nixick, and we'll be happy to answer any questions that come up after the webinar. Thanks all for joining us. Have a good one.